Politics could be more relevant today than ever before. things can be more obvious than the fact that Marx was wrong. Because if communism was better than capitalism, it wouldn't have needed a 50-foot high wall covered in snipers to keep people in. If you had a party one night and found the only way to keep the guests there was with a 50-foot high wall, and even then some of them were building a hot air balloon in an effort to escape, you wouldn't say, well, that was a successful evening. Yet the people who write Marx off don't make much sense either. New Labour says that he no longer applies because he was writing 150 years ago. But that doesn't mean he's necessarily out of date. When the Blairs are having a dinner party, do they throw their empty glasses into the air and say, oh, don't worry, you don't still believe in that gravity nonsense, do you? Isaac Newton, that was 300 years ago. The glasses won't fall, they won't float. They'll find a third way into the dishwasher. In this programme, I'm going to suggest that there's very little in the modern world that would surprise Marx, apart from his own reputation, and that he wouldn't have been very flattered by the regimes that were set up in his own name. Marx was born in 1818 in the German town of Trier. His dad, though, wasn't the most radical of fathers. At balls, he would raise a toast to the King of Prussia in the fullness of his omnipotence. Presumably while Karl stood there going, Oh, Dad... When Marx was 20, his dad died, but Marx was in Berlin and decided not to go to the funeral. As a student, Marx learnt several languages, he became familiar with Shakespeare, learnt anything connected with ancient Rome or Greece, and he became a bit weird about that, writing at one point... As a relaxation in the evenings, I have been reading Appian on the Roman Civil Wars, in the original Greek. As relaxation? Why didn't he get a video and roll a joint like everybody else? In 1835, Marx went to Bonn to study law, and from there to Berlin. But he'd already fallen in love with Jenny von Westphalen, a childhood friend, and from Bonn, he sent her poems. I could a thousand volumes fill, writing only Jenny in each line. Still they would a world of thought conceal, verses sweet that yearning gently still. You might not think much of that, but it hardly fits the soulless image presented by his enemies and his communist supporters, They'd have you think the only sort of love poem he could write would be something like, when I look at your hair and see raindrops fall off it, I'm reminded that X over V equals profit. Marx asked Jenny to marry him, but she was uncertain. Her half-brother Ferdinand, a government official, was even more dubious and asked the Berlin police to follow Marx and keep him in touch with Marx's club. The police told Ferdinand that Marx wasn't attending his lectures and spent his time arguing about God and drinking wine by the litre. Typical police... They're asked to spy on a student and the best they can come up with is he doesn't go to lectures and he drinks. Like many Berlin students drawn towards radical ideas at the time, Marx joined a group called the Young Hegelians, dedicated to the ideas of the philosopher Hegel. And Hegel was not an easy philosopher to follow. Hegel wanted to understand how changes came about. Uh, Any idea, he said, comes into constant conflict with other ideas. And the result of this conflict is new ideas and new conflicts and so on. And Hegel called this process dialectics. Now that might not seem controversial, but if every idea is constantly changing, then no idea in human society is natural. Take the idea of patriotism. And many people would argue that the most important thing about us is our country, as if our nation has existed forever. Which shouldn't be surprising when almost everything leads us to think like that like the commentary you get at the Olympics. And Davidson looking very strong indeed for Great Britain, he's coming up the straight and he's looking extremely comfortable, Davidson, and he's picking up the pace and they come to the finishing line, it's Davidson in seventh place. The winner's an American, then a Swede, a frog and a couple of krauts. But what a run from Davidson! But looked at dialectically, the idea of England or Britain is a very recent concept. I'll take another example, language. You get people who write letters into papers like the Daily Telegraph that go, Dear Sir... I was recently travelling on a bus, whereupon I had the misfortune to hear some teenagers using the word in it. 
My father was one of the many who rode to Dunkirk. If he'd known it would end up like this, he wouldn't have bothered. But looked at dialectically, the idea of a proper language doesn't make sense as it's constantly changing. You might as well say, why do we never hear the word forsooth anymore? That's the trouble with people born after 1604. No respect. So Hegel was saying that everything, nations, language, family units, take place as a result of constant change and there's nothing natural about any of them. But then he went on to argue that this change is a continuing process. And most of the time it happens behind the surface, invisible. So take a potato. You can look at a potato all day and it won't appear to change. But beneath the surface it's gradually rotting. It doesn't rot for a day and then have a rest from rotting. It rots continuously until one day it falls apart in an apparently sudden change. Some shops should have a sign over the vegetable counter. And the same process applies to human society. If you look behind the surface of any social upheaval, you'll always find a gradual build-up of people becoming frustrated to the point where they're ready to burst with rage. But if you look at the same event undialectically, you only see the sudden outburst, which is why politicians and the press usually blame any disturbance on outside agitators. It's a good job scientists don't take this attitude. See, just a moment ago, the water was quite contented, but molecules from outside the area must have spread propaganda, urging the water to turn into steam. Marx agreed with this, but concluded that there was a flaw with Hegel's theory, because for Hegel, changes in society were driven by ideas. And in this sense, Marx said, Hegel was upside down, because it's not the ideas in our head that determine the lives we lead, it's the lives we lead that determine our ideas. For example, there's religion. It's often assumed that Marx hated religion, as illustrated by his line about the opium of the people. But his starting point was that religion, like other ideas, is a product of the environment. So, for example, Christianity and Islam grew because they opposed the religions of the ruling empires. So Marx was sympathetic to religion. The whole quote was... Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creatures, the heart of a heartless world, the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. The trouble with Cliff's music is not that it's religious, so is Bob Marley's and Aretha Franklin's, but Cliff's is sanctimonious tea cake, vicar of Dibley, parish council, stars on Sunday, I'm going to heaven because I brought an unwanted tin of apricots to the Harvest Festival religion. After five years in Berlin, Marx had become a renowned doctor of philosophy, but he'd also become aware of its limitations. The philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. He became the editor of a liberal newspaper, the Rheinische Zeitung, and he wrote his theories in a book called The Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, which might not sound like a snappy title, but compare it to his first works. The Holy Family, or Critique of Critical Criticism against Bruno Bauer and Company. Or this one. Critique of Modern German Philosophy according to its representatives Feuerbach, Bauer and Stirner, and of German Socialism according to its various prophets. I bet his publishers love that. I love the bit about the potato. <laughs> it's uh, just the title. We were thinking something a little more streetwise. The Naked Philosopher. So when he did economic and philosophical manuscripts, his fans must have gone, oh, he's gone all mainstream now. For Marx, the first thing to look at in working out why a society behaved in a certain way was to see how human beings produced things, how we fed, clothed and housed ourselves. Because from the earliest man, we've survived by our ability to labour, with each extra person producing as well as consuming wealth. See, if it's true that more people makes us worse off, then when there were only a few hunter-gatherers on the entire planet, we should have been rolling in it. Whereas in the most crowded areas, like Miami, they should all be famished. Marx said that whoever was in control of this production controlled society. So in ancient societies, whoever owned the slaves controlled the cities. In feudal society, the rulers were the landowners who were allowed to drag peasants around on a piece of rope. And in capitalist society, the rulers are the people who go up and down those lifts. And then Marx said, the only reasonable course of action for the majority of people was to overthrow the rulers in a revolution. Then in 1843, the German authorities clamped down on the liberal press, so the Marxists fled to Paris, where Karl could carry on with his writing. Now, at first, they moved to this address, which is now a bailiff's, but when they lived here, it was with a group of other people in a commune, although not one that was on the television every night for 10 weeks. 
It's 3.45pm and Anita is getting fed up with Cole's constant references to the proletariat. You know, in Poland, the dissidents are tortured by the barons who beat them with canes on the soles of their feet. Ooh, I'd hate that because I've got really sensitive feet. But after two weeks, all these communists living together were getting on each other's nerves. So Marx and Jenny moved out and down the road to here, where one night they were visited by Frederick Engels, who mixed in the same radical circle. The pair went for a drink at the Café de la Régence, after which Marx suggested getting a few takeouts and carrying on back at his place, which they did for ten days. After this bonding, the pair formed a partnership that would carry on for the rest of their lives. They wrote dozens of books together, and thousands of letters to each other, including one from Marx about the Empress Eugenie. She suffers, it seems, from a most indelicate complaint. She is passionately addicted to farting and is incapable, even in company, of suppressing it. It's only a little murmur, but as you know, the French are sensitive to the slightest puff of wind. The following year, Marx and Jenny's daughter Jenny Chen was born and she was the first of six kids that they'd have over the next 12 years. But Marx was also busy with Engels. They formed the Communist League, and together they wrote the Communist Manifesto, which was only a pamphlet of about 30 pages, but it contains possibly the most famous first and last lines of any book. There is a spectre haunting Europe. It is the spectre of communism. Though in the first English edition, this was translated as a frightful hobgoblin is stalking throughout Europe. Maybe this is why in the end it managed to sell so many copies, people thought it was a book of fairy stories. And maybe this started a trend, the Labour Theory of Value and the Beanstalk. Or the Communist Manifesto, starring Leslie Joseph as the bourgeois mode of production. But all the way through are lines that must have seemed at the time as shocking as they were baffling. Society is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, bourgeoisie and proletariat. They didn't just mean rich and poor or liberals and tyrants. By bourgeoisie, they meant the people who owned and ran the workplaces. By proletariat, they meant the people they employed. Marx insisted a merchant's clerk is as much a part of the working class as any factory worker, and offices can be just as miserable as any factory. They're just not so dramatically working class. Ah! Quick, Marx! The fall of the economy has collapsed! Lecturers, salesmen, accountants, these aren't the people who own and control the banks and multinationals. And silliest of all are these northerners who say, it's all you posh middle class southerners what's got your money. Like there's no working class in the south. In which case, what do we say when the drains are busted? Hey, what a pong. Darling, better ring a northerner. At the time, there were very few factories outside Britain, so Marx and Engels were predicting the rise of industry. The bourgeoisie compels all nations to adopt the bourgeois mode of production. Which must have seemed ridiculous at the time, the idea that one day places like Central America and Malaysia could be locked into global capitalism. But now you could go to a shopping centre in Kuala Lumpur or Guatemala City and guarantee there'd be a body shop, our price, Clinton cards, gap with Westlife playing all day, fake Irish pub, McDonald's, pizza hut with a salad bar and glass screw top jar of parmesan cheese, a bloke in a green pullover trying to recruit you into the AA and a bunch of Peruvians playing I just called to say I love you on the panpipes. The Communist Manifesto ends... Workers of all countries unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Whether you agree with that or not, you've got to admit it's a bloody good last line for a book. You can't write that without being driven by passion. And compare that to the book that Blair cites as his manifesto, The Third Way, by Anthony Giddens. A dialogue of the centre-left should range much more widely as an orientation to globalisation in fact demands. Not quite the same oomph, is there? Only a few hundred copies of the Communist Manifesto had been printed and barely anybody had read it when the 1848 revolutions against monarchies broke out across Europe. But all around this area in Paris there were street battles and barricades. Marx and Engels expected the bourgeoisie to support these revolutions, but instead they panicked and helped the government to put them down. 
Marx and Engels concluded that from now on the only class that would support revolution would be the working class. But that wasn't the only long-term impact of the 1848 revolution, because 150 years later it became the subject of one of the West End's longest running musicals, so that coachloads of Americans could say, oh lovely costumes. So the thousands killed on the barricades didn't die in vain. As a result of the turmoil of the time, Marx was expelled from Paris, then from Brussels, Cologne, and then from Paris again, and eventually left for London, which was home to many European exiles. At their first address in London, they fell behind with the rent and were evicted, so they moved here to a dodgy bed and breakfast in Leicester Square. But the optimism created by the 1848 revolutions had evaporated, and Marx and Engels were left isolated. I am pleased with the isolation in which we now find ourselves. At last, we have an opportunity to show we have no need of any popularity or support whatsoever. Seems like they were making a virtue out of a necessity. They were saying, we don't want any support. With no organisation and few friends, Marx was left relying on handouts from Engels to feed his family. Marx, Jenny, the children and the maid Helene eventually moved to here in Soho, in a flat in what is now Quo Vardis, a fashionable eatery partly owned by restaurateur and top cow pickler Damien Hurst. But when Marx was here, there was no running water and no toilet. It was so squalid that a leading Prussian spy, William Stieber, who'd been sent to follow Marx, sent back a report that only went on about the state of his flat. Everything is broken, battered and torn, finger-thick dust everywhere. On one table are teacups with dirty rims, dirty spoons, tobacco ash, all kinds of trash that a junk dealer would be ashamed of. If you sit down, you risk a pair of trousers. That's bad when the spy obviously feels the urge to tidy up. But then Marx developed a liver complaint, which resulted in him being covered in boils. In a letter to Engels, he wrote, Another carbuncle has erupted right under the place to which Goethe refers. I cannot walk, nor stand, nor sit, and lying down is damn difficult. And you should be informed that a new furuncle has broken out on my back. Must have been quite an experience getting a letter from Marx. You wouldn't be sure whether it was going to be a thesis on dialectics or a moan about boils on his arse. There was the odd moment of relief, such as the night he went up Tottenham Court Road with his friend Liebnitz having a beer in each of the 18 pubs. In the last pub, they were thrown out after a row with the locals about whether Germany was a better place to live than England. You're the best comrade you are, Liebnitz, you know that. Come on, let's try the feathers. On the way home, according to Liebnitz, Marx and I picked up some stones and smashed a gas lamp into splinters. We broke four or five street lamps until a policeman gave the signal to his colleagues on the beat, when Marx showed an agility I should not have attributed to him. See, loads of people argue about what Marx would say if he were alive today, but what he'd probably say would be... Large donner with chilli sauce, please. Chicken or lamb? Uh, lamb, please. At one point, he was sufficiently boil-free to sleep with Helen the maid. How typically Victorian. Helen became pregnant and the household came up with the classic Victorian solution, the kid was sent away and hidden in the East End of London. Jenny was told the truth, but to spare embarrassment for the rest of the family, Engels gallantly took the rap for fathering the child. It could sometimes be argued that Engels was slightly put upon as a friend, so the Marxist household veered into every type of misery. Sometimes Marx couldn't leave the house because his clothes had all been pawned. Their fourth child, Guido, had died suddenly, and a fifth, Francisca, died soon after she was born, and they couldn't afford a coffin. Jenny wrote... I ran to a French refugee who lived nearby. He showed the greatest sympathy and gave me two pounds. With these, we bought the little coffin in which my poor child now slumbers in peace. But it was with this background that Marx set about compiling the book that would explain the workings of capitalism, Capital. Every day he would walk from Dean Street, through Soho, to the British Library. Marx researched capital for 15 years. 
Six months after the original deadline for the book, he answered the publisher's letter demanding the final copy by saying there was no need to worry. I shall have finished soon, having finally begun the actual writing. <sighs> for all his analysis of work, he doesn't seem to have understood that employers aren't usually happy when six months after you're supposed to have finished, you say, good news, I've started. Despite its image as one of the most unreadable books of all time, much of Capital is just about some of the unfairness that Marx saw around him. There's a section on the railways. Everyone knows the consequences if the driver and the fireman are not continually on the lookout. How can that be expected from a man who has been at work for 29 hours without rest? But its originality was in its attempt to explain how exploitation is an inevitable part of capitalism. The value of a commodity, Marx said, comes from the amount of labour that is invested in it, and a worker receives only a fraction of that value. Which is why somebody can work in a sweatshop and at the end of the week their wages aren't enough to buy a single pair of the trainers that they've been making. And then we end up with a society in which nothing can be made unless it yields a profit, or as Marx called it, surplus value. And then the capitalist, having made the profit, then takes this orange home to use it for autoerotic purposes. And take a single modern problem like unemployment. Marx argued this happened because capitalism went into periodic crises in which profits dipped, causing employers to lay off workers. Whereas Blair, like Margaret Thatcher before him, comes up with schemes to give the unemployed the incentive to work. As if unemployment is caused by people who can't be bothered to work. In which case, wasn't the 20th century peculiar? Started off with people being lazy, then they got all fired up, in the 1930s got lethargic again, then perked up in the 40s, which was handy as it was just in time for the war, and then they stayed lively until the 80s and then decided to stay in bed all day, which does make sense as this coincides with the invention of the duvet. But, Marx said, it gets worse. Because capitalists are in competition with each other, then they're compelled to try and lengthen the working day to increase productivity and get ahead of their rivals. And that's not out of date. When I was a kid, I was told that by the year 2000, we'd all be working one hour a day and spending the rest of the time dressed in aluminium foil. Instead, the working week's longer than ever. Lunch breaks have been replaced by a woman who comes round with sandwiches. Banana and tuna, pigeon and fig, low-fat whale on giabata, chicken and petrol. <laughs> And new technology has increased the workload. Mobile phones and laptops mean people are now expected to work on the way to and from work. Even in the cotton mills, people weren't expected to drag a power loom away with them and keep weaving all the way home. When Marx finally completed Capital, he couldn't afford the postage to send it to the publisher until Engels lent him the money for the stamp. And while the book may have contained the answer to the world's economic problems, it didn't solve any of Marx's, as it only sold about 200 copies in the first few years. Then, when Marx and his family had been living for a week on bread and potatoes and were ill but couldn't afford to send for a doctor, Marx received a telegram to say that Engels' wife had died, and Marx replied to Engels, The news of Mary's death surprised no less than it dismayed me. I no longer know which way to turn either. If I don't get a larger sum, our household can scarcely survive another two weeks. Things became so dire that Jenny went to Paris to beg off a rich friend. But when she got there, the friend died. Though if it had been Carl, he'd have probably gone to see the bloke's family. Yes? Hello, my name's Carl Marx. Uh, I've got a bit of bad news, I'm afraid. Uh, your brother's died. Oh, my God. Yes, a bit of a shock. <laughs> anyway, the thing is, uh, he was going to lend me a few bob, and, uh, well, now that he's gone, obviously it's a bit awkward, so... Um, I couldn't nab a score, could I? <laughs> his state of mind was such that he began to wish his mother would die so that he could be bailed out by the inheritance. And when she did go, he wrote... Two hours ago, a telegram arrived to say that my mother is dead. I already had one foot in the grave, and in the circumstances, I'm needed more than the old woman. The only time he nearly succumbed to getting a paid job was when he applied to be a railway clerk, but was turned down for his illegible handwriting. So it's lucky his wife copied his books out for him, or the confusion about what he'd written would have carried on up till now. In 1864, Marx helped found the International Working Men's Association, because he could see that although working class people are brought together collectively, that doesn't mean they're automatically united. 
because they can be fantastically inventive at finding new ways of dividing themselves. Race, country, sex, football team, town. I was in Glasgow once, told a bloke I was going to Edinburgh, and he just said, oh, you don't want to go there, it's shit. Stuck up, we middle-class, bouncy place, Edinburgh, don't want to go there. I said, well, not everyone's stuck up a middle class, are they in Edinburgh? He said, hey, every single person, by the way. I said, all right, then what about the dustman? He said, hey, even them, stuck up, we middle-class dustman. I thought, oh, right, like there's all these dustmen wandering around Edinburgh going, I can't possibly put that in the back of the truck. Uh, those eggshells aren't free range, you understand. But it's a two-way process, Mark said, because workers are compelled to defend their conditions by organising collectively into groups like trade unions. The event that reshaped the communist movement was the Paris Commune of 1871. Following the defeat of the French armies by the Prussians, the people of Paris seized the city. They installed a commune, set up free elections, free education, abolished private property and most spectacularly pulled over the statue of Napoleon in the Place Vendôme. In response, Marx wrote to the civil war in France that ended... The Commune will be honoured forever as the glorious herald of a new social order. After three months, the Commune was put down and thousands were executed in the streets. Marx was expecting to be ignored, as usual, but the British and French press went berserk, accusing him, in effect, of stirring up the whole thing as an agitator from outside the area. Marx wrote to a friend... I have the honour of being at this time the most slandered and most threatened man in London. This is something to be grateful for after 20 years of a rustic idyll. Which may seem odd, but Marx was a rebel. And like any rebel, his greatest fear wasn't abuse or even torture, it was being ignored. You don't, you don't know where Halfords is, do you? Uh, Halfords? Sorry, I don't know. Would you like a leaflet? But Marx's liver was in a bad way, and then he was to suffer two further blows from which he wouldn't recover. His daughter Jenny Chen died, and his wife Jenny died. And then in 1883, Marx died himself, aged 65. He was buried at Highgate Cemetery with a picture found in his top pocket of his father Heinrich, and 11 people came to the funeral. But then, as capitalism swept through the world, so did working class movements, many of which derived their ideas from Marx. But the regime set up in his name embodied the opposite of all that he dreamed for. If Marx had seen a Soviet May Day rally or the Cultural Revolution in China or the invasion of Hungary or flown on air a flot or driven a Trabant, he would probably have repeated what he said in an interview towards the end of his life. All I know is that I'm no Marxist. One of the best insights into Marx's character was the answers he gave to a questionnaire. Favourite motto? Everything should be doubted. Favourite hero? Spartacus. Idea of happiness, to fight. Favourite dish, fish. Which I bet has caused at least one left-wing group to split over whether he meant halibut or cod. But compare that to the answer that Tony Blair gave to a questionnaire that asked him, what is the last dream you remember? And he replied, I don't have much time for sleep, let alone dreams. He doesn't seem to be aware that dreams don't take up any more time than sleep. If you have a 10 minute dream, you don't wake up going, oh no, that dream's made me 10 minutes late. That's the marvellous thing about them. You can dream and sleep at the same time. Marx could have used the middle class position that he was born with to become a respectable member of German society. Instead, he decided to pursue a dream of a world in which the ingenuity and spirit of every human could be tapped rather than squandered in contrast to those people who have forgotten how to dream. To dream the impossible dream To fight the unbeatable foe To bear with unbearable sorrow To run where the brave dare not go. Leonardo 